So, uh, like you might uh, you might do a qualitative study, right, and then you will come up with this kind of frequencies right? or number of people said this, uh, and then you want to in qualitative analysis you want to come up with themes, inter themes, and this will be very useful. Right? And we want to uh, base on you know, based on the number of uh, or number of uh, people said certain things, and you identify so many you know, people said so many uh, similar things, and you came up with these numbers. And then you want to create a higher level, you know, uh, and you want to come up with a kind of a central theme, and this will be very useful plus analysis for that okay. So in qualitative analysis, also it's very useful. So under, under the graphs, if you go legacy dialogues, and, and don't go to chart builder, go to legacy dialogues, and uh, it's all for the line, right? Line chart, line chart, and we just select the uh, uh, simple, and then now include. Uh, for example, category, right? And if you want to look at by the the row, right? Distance, sorry, cluster uh, versus distance. Right? I would rather use the uh, cluster number for the rows, and then cluster distance for the axis, and then I will say without doing anything okay, let's see what happens. Here's the graph. Something like bar charts or something. You know? uh, let's say if you take uh, cluster number and then charts, bar charts, because bar chart would be useful for, uh, and there are categories, right? So yeah, there are two categories. It will look like this. Uh, that how many are classified as one and how many are classified as two. Otherwise, we have to plot something like this, the distance versus the counts or something. So we can see that there's higher frequency here for when for this distance here. Right? Uh, that means we see more observations for this distance. So there's a peak here, you can see. Here. But otherwise, if you are using just one variable and two categories, then bar chart is the is a better way. This is the way to go about. Okay. So the cluster center, uh, cluster membership, we saw that here, right? and we can utilize some of this information for for analysis. It's interesting. Right? See here. This is the initial cluster centers, right? And then its final cluster centers is this half iteration 192 and 397. So if you go up here, it's giving you 104 and 62. So when we fed in the information, there were two clusters to, to start with. So the because we asked the algorithm to do it, the software to do it. So it initially classified this into two clusters. Right? You can take this as, in a way for us to understand this, we can take it as categories. Really it's not categories because the algorithm is not assuming anything. It doesn't have any predetermined memory to do anything because it just takes our instructions. But when we started, it came up with two, two clusters. Those two clusters looked like it was 104 and 62. Now what happened was, when it went through the iterations, these clusters, because of the rearrangement of observations based on the, on the centroid or, or the mean, uh, and, and this mean keeps varying from from one iteration to another. Right? Ultimately, when 
the the iteration becomes zero zero value that means it has obtained the most optimum mean or most optimum centroid of uh, the the center points around which the observations now gather so that is what happened so once after eight iterations the two clusters are like this 192 and 397 and the distance between the final cluster centers is that right 204 okay. here's the anova and you can see here in this anova the it is significant right so it's showing that these clusters are distinctly different that's what it's saying right and then you can also see uh, that error here right uh mean square of error that means the the explanation of the error right? in in average term, mean means average right? mean square it's fast to understand especially for batch so you to understand can think about error means what is unexplained right? so what we want to do is we want to minimize what is unexplained and in this analysis through the iterations that's what it's trying to do and it's so you can see when it comes to the cluster you can see the mean square there is 147 and the mean square of the error is 4108 0.429 so com comparatively that mean square is very high in the cluster what it what it tells us is that that the cluster explanation is far greater than what is not explained otherwise and the significance is it uses something called a f test that different techniques a test values it can use but significantly it, it is is something worthy of of considering and uh, statistically is worthy of considering that's what it says so these two clusters are statistically statistically different they are worthy of considering that's what it says uh, anova is actually not a analysis that is using cluster analysis uh, analysis of variance is a is a principle uh, that is used when there is a dependent outcome variable and then you have categorical that means categories and you want to look at the relationship uh, towards an outcome variable outcome but in cluster analysis there's no outcome variable that we are consider we don't consider as to when we are looking at a cluster is this cluster has some relationship you know this when this uh, when these values change when something else change we don't consider that right? so anova is not something uh, that that we technically use in cluster analysis but it it tells us some some valuable information that's why it says it's for descriptive purposes only because it tells us that the cluster has far more meaning right, compared to what is not explained that we understand from this right, because uh, that the value mean square is much greater than the mean square of the error mean square of the cluster is much greater uh, so here uh, the focus here is whether there are any missing values so it has taken all the values that we have fed in for consideration we don't have any missing values and i said there are any missing values then we have to take care of them and also which it doesn't say here but if there are especially if there are outliers that means extreme values when we are entering information then then we should sit back and think about those uh, extreme values with them they are really important 
you're going to they must be there to be included because they can change the averages and this clustering technique or clustering method works on averages that's how it does it arranges clusters so therefore outliers become very important their influence become very important here's the descriptive statistics of course we we ask for the distance here that is when we when ask about the further analysis and then i did this you can go into details like this like for example once you have done the clustering you can go into further details if you want to uh, and provide additional information like cluster distance minimum and the maximum distance and the mean or the average and the standard deviation that is the uh, the the distance of of uh, the population uh, or, or about 95 percent of that population the distance around which this they, they live around the cluster center and so forth that's from the standard deviation uh, it, because it shows the distance or the spread we can make certain determinations okay so what else we did uh, what's the number cases okay uh, that's about it. okay good so we looked at uh, k-main cluster analysis but if, if your research question is such that the, the distance from the cluster has provide provide some if additional information then you can use it otherwise uh, by and large most use cluster as a way of categorizing observations into so the, that's the main thing, but sometimes the, the distance can be helpful as well. It depends on uh, the research question in hand.